Hi, my name is Amy Stone. I'm an agriculture and natural resources educator with Ohio State University in Lucas County, which is in Northwest Ohio. Toledo is our county seat. I'm gonna to talk to you today on what I'm calling the ABCs of invasive species. And we're gonna focus really on four um, insects that you may come in contact with or just may want um, kind of a brief update on what's happening. And so we are gonna talk and kind of kick off the presentation uh, about the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. It's something that everybody can help us with by monitoring reporting invasive species. And so just want to give a quick shout out about that. And then the four insect species that we're going to cover um, are gypsy moth, the Asian longhorn beetle, the emerald ash borer, and the spotted lanternfly. The app, if you don't have it um, and want to learn more, um, there is a whole webinar on how to use the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app on the Ohio Woodland Stewards website. And so check that out. Um, we encourage people to download the app um, and report invasive species that they're seeing in their home landscape, um, in their woodlot, or in their community. And so we've got individuals who go out specifically looking uh, to report invasive species or some people that have their phone with them and when they're out in the park and they notice an invasive species, um, they'll make that report. All the reports are tied to a mapping system that you can check out and see where people have reported that specific invasive. The app is full of all sorts of invasives. So you can sort by category. Um, you can see an entire list of all the species. You can make your own species list if you want. Um, it's tied very closely to the early detection and distribution mapping system. And that's what we use to see where those reports then are across the Buckeye State. Uh, one good thing that I just kind of wanted to mention is there is a net negative survey option on the app. And so if you're joining us to, re um, to monitor and report um, spotted lanternfly, um, we're encouraging people to make negative reports. So if they're out in Ohio looking for spotted lanternfly but don't see the insect, make a negative report so we know where people are looking for this kind of new pest on the radar. This is an example, somebody reported Oriental Bittersweet, uh, but very important to include images of what you're seeing so we can confirm that and verify your report. It uses the long and latitude um, on your phone so we get an exact location. Um, you can keep track of how much time you spend doing the reports if you want to. Um, and then give us any detailed information. You can do a, a dot on the map, so you know maybe a single infestation, or if it's a large infestation, you can draw a polygon around where that um, invasive species is. Know that when you do the reports, they're gonna go into the queue. And so we don't see those until you upload the queue. Uh, the reason we did this is people often, obviously are making reports out in the field and we don't wanna use up all your data out in the field. And so once you get back to your location where let's say you have Wi-Fi, you can connect, hit upload to the queue and all your reports then will be emailed to us. This just gives you an idea. Um, you can see here the points of the map um, are all verified reports that have come in. Um, and you can look at that data and see where the local, the closest um, you know, specific invasive species is to you. So let's jump in with our first insect. So gypsy moth, this one has been around for a very long time. Um, I kind of coined the term living to learning to live with the gypsy moth. There are some different color forms that you may see. Um, so kind of more kind of the grayish silver scale to the left and more kind of an orangey scale to the right. Uh, but you'll notice the pairs or rows of uh, blue and then red dots are the same no matter kind of the overall color um, that you see. Sometimes uh, when people hear about gypsy moth, they think that every caterpillar that they find um, in the woods um, or in their own landscape is gypsy moth. And there are some other ones out there. So let's do a little comparison here quick. Both of these insects actually will defoliate oaks. Uh, both can produce outbreak populations, so high numbers. Uh, both are, are photos um, 
relating to that insect that caused that defoliation. Gypsy moth is non-native. Our forest tent caterpillar is native. And so, but they can cause the same response, right? Or the same results. When we look at gypsy moth, I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. We've got the rows or pairs of dots or bumps. Um, start out blue at the back of the head uh, with five rows, uh, followed by six rows of the red. And so very distinct, nothing else like that. Forest tent caterpillar, on the other hand, kind of has a single row or pattern on its back. Some people um, compare that, those markings um, to what footprints may look like. And so if that kind of captures your attention or you see that visually, um, that might be something to remember um, for identification purposes. The impact of gypsy moth, it can be a potential killer. So it's not a wood borer, it's not going after the, the, the trunk, the stems, the branches. Um, it's a caterpillar feeder, it's eating the leaves. Um, and we're gonna kind of just compare oaks to spruces. So deciduous trees to conifers um, or evergreens. And so this caterpillar will feed on both. Um, as it relates to oaks, that damage um, happens early in the spring it sends out new leaves, the plant typically recovers. If we see defoliation year after year, we may see some decline and ultimate death of those um, oak trees, especially if it's coupled with maybe excess moisture or a drought or another insect pest that's kind of plaguing that particular tree. Very differently when it eats the foliage, the, the leaves, the needles of an evergreen like the spruce here, once those needles are gone, uh, that tree is pretty much gone as well. And you can see the progression here. And so um, pretty heavy population eating those needles. Um, most of the needles are gone, very few left. Um, and then finally, the tree's dead. Um, all the needles have been consumed and it's not gonna send out new needles next year. And so if you have spruce in an area um, and other evergreens um, in a gypsy moth outbreak, you really wanna pay attention and focus management efforts on those especially um, because it can be deadly. I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I mean, it can have an impact um, the first year on deciduous trees, usually when it's coupled with some other stresses. Um, but what we like to kind of look at is that if you've got a, a healthy deciduous tree, um, oaks are the favorite, but they will feed on others. If you have greater than 50% um, canopy dieback, right, um, or defoliation, one or two years, you're probably going to be okay. Um, if you have greater than 50 for three years or plus, um, that usually is not okay. And that really kind of stresses that plant to the, the extent that then it's um, other insects might find it attractive. Um, and you can see, you know, very mature large trees um, die as a result of multiple years of gypsy moth infestations. Really doesn't um, apply when we talk about a newly planted tree. Um, sometimes they can't take that multiple year. They're already going through a lot of shock and tra trauma because of the transplant. And so when you have defoliation, even in a first year, um, that can cause some decline in stresses. So let's talk about life cycles. So right now, gypsy moths are in their egg mass stage. There can be 50 to several hundred eggs in a particular mass. Uh, we kind of rough that up a little bit so you can see those individual eggs there. Those eggs are going to hatch in the early spring, the same time that red buds are blooming. And so if you're into growing degree days, that's about 192. Uh, first instar caterpillars will balloon on a silken thread. They'll get caught up in wind currents and they'll attach themselves or find leaves and begin eating on that foliage. If they don't like it, they're going to balloon and do that again until they find a host that they really um, find favorable. So just a photo here of red buds. If you're not familiar with that native tree, um, it's in the legume family, great plant. Uh, but now whenever you see it blooming in the spring, you should think, gosh, if we have gypsy moth, they'll be hatching at the same time. As the caterpillars uh, progress through their instars, uh, they're going to get larger. They're going to do more feeding, cause more injury. 
Uh, the photo to the right um, in that spruce or evergreen, you can see there's some needles that are left, but you'll also see kind of some, oh, kind of army colored green things. Um, that's their frass, their excrement, uh, which can really kind of be messy when you have high populations. So if you have a tree that's being fed upon over uh, maybe a vehicle that's parked in the driveway, that frass is gonna accumulate on the vehicle. If you have a, a limb that hangs over a patio area, the caterpillars are feeding, the frass is falling, that's gonna accumulate on you know, chairs, picnic tables, even in a pool if, if you have a limb that overhangs a pool. In the early summer, once the caterpillars are done feeding, they're gonna pupate before they uh, make it to adulthood. Uh, right here's a photo of an adult female uh, laying an egg mass. The male is um, similar kind of characteristics. It's more kind of a, a brown nondescript color, a um, little bit smaller in size. Um, the males fly in a zigzag kind of crazy pattern during the day. Uh, the females give off a pheromone uh, that he finds attractive, finds mates with her, and then she lays the egg mass for the next generation. Just a little history. Um, if you're not familiar with gypsy moth, uh, the infestation was initially discovered in 1868 in Bedford, Massachusetts. A French scientist brought gypsy moth to the country on purpose. Um, it escaped and has been spreading westward, a little bit north and a little bit south um, ever since. And so you can see Ohio is part of that um, growing infestation. We like to say there's three management zones when it comes to gypsy moth. There's the suppression or quarantine zone, so areas that have been infested um, and can become reinfested. And so it's not a constant infestation. Uh, populations will kind of go up and down. The second area um, or zone is called slow the spread, and you can see it's the leading edge. Um, there's a lot of effort. Uh, there's a lot of time and management that goes into this the slow the spread zone to helpfully push that population or kind of keep it into the suppression or quarantine zone. And then finally, the eradication zone. And so um, the eradication zone is an area where if a find is, is, is determined to be gypsy moth, they will do um, kind of a lot of work and a lot of effort to try to eradicate or eliminate Again, so we don't get these hot spots that then build and, and then our suppression zone just um, continues to expand pretty rapidly. If we look at Ohio and wanna look at those three zones, um, this is a map from 2014. So you can see here, the red is the suppression zone. So areas that have had infestations currently or in the past, we've got the slow the spread zone. And so kind of that swath that a lot of activity to manage um, gypsy moth is in. And then finally, we have some, um, some counties in the eradication. And so it kind of can make it confusing when you have all three zones in your state. Uh, but wanna show you. And so here we've got what's happening in 2020. So those three zones illustrated, you may see, you know, some of the counties changed a little bit. Uh, but the idea is again to push that leading edge back into the suppression zone and avoid it spreading into uninfested or the eradication area. All right, so our next pest up is Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, the map for Asian longhorn beetle looks very different than gypsy moth. Uh, relatively small isolated infestations, which is good news because the goal for Asian longhorn beetle in North America is to eradicate and eliminate. Eradication has been successful in several states, several areas, and so that is the goal in any of the infestations that are still um, remaining, is to totally eliminate and eradicate ALB from North America. Couple little things, um, when we have a new infestation, it typically is a single point of introduction directly from Asia. And so that's based on DNA analysis. So anytime there's a new infestation, uh, USDA does some DNA analysis to determine, okay, was it an infestation that was already occurring in North America and just got moved around? 
or is it a new infestation that came directly from, from Asia? Once you have that initial infestation, it kind of goes undetected under the radar. And while that population builds, some things happen. And so there's often things get moved around. And so there's multiple related infestations in the region uh, based on that movement of, let's say, firewood, nursery stock, logs. Um, so not great distances, but kind of all in that general region or, or vicinity. So again, it is important to know that although you may not be close to um, the infestation in Claremont County and you think, oh, I don't need to worry about Asian longhorn beetle, um, it should be on your radar because we never know when we may get a new infestation uh, from Asia. So Asian longhorn beetle, um, it is a serum bisset. Uh, we do have some native longhorn beetles. Um, our native insects tend to attack only dead and dying trees. We tend to see them sometimes accumulate um, or populations in firewood. So again, kind of dead and dying. Where this one is a little bit different, it will attack a very healthy and living tree. Um, it got its name longhorn beetle because of the long antenna. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that the antenna of the um, Asian longhorn beetle has black and white bands. So key characteristics, something to look at uh, when we're looking at some of those longhorn beetles. It's a pretty large beetle. Um, just a little humor here. Uh, make sure that you're paying attention and, and keep learning. Um, but really, it, it's not that large. Um, it ranges in the size from three-fourths of an inch to an inch and a half. Uh, most are over an inch long. Uh, the females tend to be a little bit larger than the males. The larvae of the insect, it is a round-headed bore. And so you can see here, this is the first thoracic segment uh, that's present. Here's an early instar. I like to say it looks like the Michelin tire man. Um, and then a later in star, so real beefy, uh, lots to it, um, very powerful mandibles. Note that um, I had mentioned that we do have some native roundhead or um, cerambicids. Um, we'll see those in dead and dying trees, uh, but not to say if you're seeing a longhorn beetle that you think may be Asian longhorn beetle, whether it was on a living tree or one that was dead or dying, uh, make sure that you capture a photo, capture the insect. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't have any new building populations of this insect. We're going to talk about host range. And so when we talk about host range, maples are very um, a, a preference. Um, they really like the maples. In the infested trees here in Ohio, 98% of them are maples, with uh, red maples being top, followed by sugar and silver. In addition, they'll feed on horse chestnuts and buckeyes, elms and willows, and a whole nother list here that's coming up on your screen. And so, you know, I challenge, there's probably anybody that's watching this um, training, does anybody not have one of those plants? And so you can always focus your efforts. Um, if you have a maple, I would really focus and watch for those uh, because they do show preference. Uh, but you can look for all trees to see um, signs and symptoms of this insect. So you can see um, 12 different plant um, genuses, which are represented in nine plant families. So uh, very broad host range beetle. And so just a quick review, what you need to look for, what you may be seeing out in the field. Um, in heavily infested trees, you're going to see branch breakage. And so a result of that feeding injury. And so that weakens the, the branches. Um, so wind or not, no wind. Um, I mean, you could have some, some breakage there. Um, so when a, a, a limb falls out, um, or breaks off primarily in a maple, but other trees, really look and see what the cause of that is. And do you see signs of, of insect infestation? We'll see some bark splitting. Um, and so that's the tree's response to try to callus uh, that injury off. Um, and so that can be kind of throughout the canopy. 
you can see some vertical splitting here. So not, you know, obvious shouting out, I have Asian longhorn beetle, uh, but just things that you really want to be on the lookout for. The exit holes of Asian longhorn beetle are very distinct, perfectly round. You can stick a number two pencil in it and you can stick that pencil in a little ways because of the feeding activity and how they go into the heartwood. And so you can see that here. Another example. We, we talked a little bit about the woodpecker activity, so excavating kind of large holes to go in to find these, um, the larvae. Um, and so that, again, would be another um, sign of a heavily infested tree when you're seeing that much activity. You'll also, um, early in the season, as she's chewing those pits, you could notice those. Um, sometimes you can actually, you'll, you could observe the, the female herself doing that. Um, or if she's moved on, you may see that fresh injury. As a result of that injury, sometimes we'll see um, trees bleed uh, from, that, from that area. You'll also see frass, um, so they kind of kick out that frass. Um, so you'll see that collect near um, crotch angles of trees around the base of the tree. Um, that would be something to investigate a little bit further if you saw that. Pretty coarse and thick. And finally, the beetles. Um, they can be pretty obvious when, again, population numbers are high and they're out there flying around. Um, and then if you would happen to, to cut down the tree or, um, you know, have a branch break off, you could actually also see the, the. So I encourage you to be on the lookout for the Asian longhorn beetle. If you suspect anything, so the beetle itself or any of those things that, that we talked about in the previous slide, please let somebody know, either USDA, ODA, or your local extension office, um, and they'll get you to the connected to the right person. Uh, but very serious pest, but a pest that can um, and hopefully will be eradicated from Ohio and other areas in North America. All right, the next insect that we're gonna cover is the emerald ash borer. This is gonna be a really kind of quick update. Uh, most people have lived through um, emerald ash borer. Some people have some remaining ash trees that made it through. Um, some people have systemically been treating trees to protect them from this insect and can do that successfully. And so what I wanna share with you um, as it relates to the emerald ash borer is just the initial county EAB detections in North America. This map was updated on September 1st, 2020, and it gives you kind of the, the breadth and scope of where EAB is in North America. This is updated on a monthly basis and can kind of help, especially if you are going into an area. And so you're very familiar with emerald ash borer, you're visiting somewhere, and you see the signs and symptoms of emerald ash borer. Is it already in an infested state or is it something that I really need to report to somebody because it may be a new infestation? So keep your eyes peeled, especially as you're traveling and help those, um, those areas that may not be familiar with this pest that we've lived with um, for quite a while here in Ohio. All right, so we've made it to the last insect that we're gonna cover today. It's the spotted lanternfly. The spotted lanternfly is native to Asia or parts of Asia. Um, so you can see some areas that are listed on the slide. Know that um, it was not native in Korea and Japan and both of those areas are also uh, fighting this invasive species. In North America, it was first discovered in September of 2014 in southeastern Pennsylvania, outside of the, the Philadelphia area. And I believe there are 26 um, counties in Pennsylvania that have current infestations. Additionally, there are several other states that have reproducing populations, and then a few more states that have found an individual um, or individuals um, so those likely are hitchhikers that were in a vehicle or on a vehicle, and when they made it to the destination, the person noticed um, the insect and reported it, uh, but after um, survey work, they did not find a reproducing population, thank goodness, 
Um, this is the category though that Ohio is under. And so we have uh, been on the receiving end of these hitchhikers. And that's why it's really important if you're traveling through an infested area in Pennsylvania or some of these other states to be aware, make sure that you check your vehicle and that we just um, stay vigilant, right? And so we've got to really focus um, on transportation paths or corridors that this insect could lead or co could come through um, and become established here in Ohio. It's easy to say, um, or it's fair to say, I guess, that Tree of Heaven is the primary favorite host of the spotted lanternfly adult. It will also feed on grapes um, and also has been observed in apples, other fruit trees, and hops. The uh, instar, the, the nymphs, um, as they go through their progression or instars, have a much wider host range. And a scientist in Virginia was collectively looking where they were finding egg masses. And you can see that list here. Uh, but scroll through towards the bottom of that list, you'll also notice a concrete wall and a metal drum. And so any flat surface, uh, this insect will lay eggs on and can be moved in that manner. They also are um, kind of coordinating or building a list of plants that they find this insect feeding on. And that list is growing. And so right now there's about 70 different host plants uh, that the nymphs and adults can feed upon. The adults are very large, about an inch in, uh, inch in length and a half inch wide. Uh, very, very beautiful insects. Both the adults and the nymphs uh, feed with their piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, they are stem feeders where that mouth part gets inserted into tree branches, tree trunks, um, the woody part of the plant uh, where their feeding occurs. The impact um, is kind of this bleeding of trees and shrubs where one, the, the point of entry uh, where that mouth part went in. Sometimes as they pull out, you'll see that, that sap bleeding. Um, additionally, as they're feeding, um, they're gonna um, just deposit some honeydew. And so that can kind of give a, a sugary substance uh, appearance to that where black sooty mold then can adhere to and um, become quite noticeable. Wasps and hornets are also attracted to that sticky substance and so uh, that sugary substance. And so if you see a proliferation of these insects around uh, Tree of Heaven or other plants that have the sooty mold and this, um, this sap, look around because likely um, we might have an infestation of spotted lantern. Currently, the adults are active in known infestations. They appear in late summer. They feed, mate, and lay eggs. And so here's some photos just illustrating that. Here's a photo of what the egg mass looks like. So the eggs are individual, um, kind of in, laid in rows, or some people describe it as a chain. The eggs then are typically covered with a waxy coating or material that as it ages, it kind of breaks apart and crumbles a little bit. Um, you can see here the egg mass or the eggs weren't totally covered, so you see some exposed on the top of that mass, uh, but kind of has that kind of muddy, um, glossy, waxy appearance to that. Here are two egg masses um, in comparison to the gypsy moth, so another invasive species that we talked about. And so you can see here they can be again laid on any surface. Um, they can sometimes be a little camouflaged on that particular surface depending on what it is. And here um, on a, a rusty container um, or barrel. There is concern that egg masses potentially could be laid on trains, um, train cars, rail cars, um, other vehicles that then are trans supported um, or moved across the country. And so there's a lot of outreach and education uh, with folks in those industries to make sure that they're not moving egg masses. 
The nymphs hatch in the spring. They go through four instars or stages. The first three, uh, the insect is black with white spots. As it progresses to the fourth instar, you'll notice those red patches that appear. And so those are the two um, color variations that we see on the, um, the, the nymphs. If you have any questions about any of the invasive species that I talked about today, or maybe an invasive that I didn't get to talk about in our short time together, please shoot me an email. Um, say that you tuned in to the talk and you want some follow-up information or have additional questions. It was my pleasure to talk about invasives and you have a great day.